So I see a lot of guys getting really confused when their partner wants space or some variation of space like breakup or divorce, etc. And so in this video, I want to show you why your partner wants space, the real root reason why she wants space. And once you know why, you can really start to avoid the key mistakes that I see a lot of men making and what you can do to try to reattract her back at this moment. And I've taught the same thing to thousands of my clients who started off in actually much worse positions than their partner simply wanting space. And so I can't wait to show you um, these new mindsets and how to avoid these key mistakes right now. And to begin this, I wanna talk about the three common misconceptions that I think a lot of people have when it comes to their partner wanting space. The first misconception is that they think that if their partner wants space, that means that it's really over. They, you have a lot of comments, for example, saying, oh, if your partner wants space, then really they have found someone else. They're really not loyal. Uh, it's really hopeless now. They've made up their mind and there's nothing you can do to change it. And usually I get this from guys who say things like, Jeff, you don't understand my partner. Once my partner says she's done, she's actually 100% done. There's no way, nothing you can do to change your mind. It's done. The second misconception that I see a lot of people making is that your partner wanting space means that this is usually her problem. So you start to blame this on your partner. And usually the blame here comes from the root of my partner is really being non-committal. She's an ungrateful person because you think, for example, okay, after all I've done, after all we've been through, after all the financial, all the emotional, all the time, all the energy that I've dedicated to this relationship, you're just gonna leave me like that. And these people too usually has friends and family kind of saying similar things to them. That, oh, you deserve better. If she doesn't appreciate you for who you are, doesn't appreciate what you've done for her and she can leave you like this, then she really doesn't deserve your love, etc. And these people usually are also very angry. You see a lot of these very angry comments in my videos a lot. If you go to the comment section of my videos on space, for example, you will see a ton of these very angry, very bitter people. And they're bitter because they're really blaming this, the fact that their partner wants space on their partner. And the third misconception is really when guys have the wrong understanding of why their partner really wants space. So they might think, for example, oh, my partner wants space because she's kind of having a midlife crisis or she wants space because she's having bipolar disorder. She's having kind of a hard time at work. She has some PTSD. She has some unresolved childhood issues, etc. But again, these guys, they don't have the real reality of what's happening because it's not that your partner is wanting space because there's a midlife crisis. She's depressed. She feels anxious, PTSD, midlife crisis, etc. It's really that she's having all these things, but she does not want to go through it with you. Because if you had the safety in that relationship, then yes, you might have all these issues, but of all the people in the world that I wanna go through my issues with, it will be you and vice versa for your partner. But if you don't have the safety, no admiration, no alignment, then yes, you have all these problems, but it's not just these problems, but I also don't wanna go through these problems with you as well. So the real reason here, guys, is not these problems, but really that you lack safety, you lack admiration, you lack the five pillars. So the way you can fix and get through these three misconceptions is you need to truly understand and truly feel why she wants space and accept the true nature of your situation here. So to really allow you to understand this, I want you to do two interesting or fun <laughs> thought experiments with me. So the first one is, I want you to take yourself back to when you were younger. Maybe you were middle school, high school, college, young adult, whatever it is. I'm sure that a lot of you, when you were younger, you had some fantasies. You had some dreams about what you want your relationship to be like. The kind of woman you'll meet, the level of fulfillment she'll give you, the level of just bliss and the kind of relationship, the dream relationship that you want. I want you to take yourself back to those dreams, to those expectations that you have about your relationship. Now, once you do that, I want you to imagine that you met someone who you thought embodied all those things and could give you your dream relationship. And I want you to imagine that eventually you realize that they fall very short of giving you this dream relationship, very short. So you can see this from a few models, for example, you can look at this from the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So what if you, know, you are looking for the self-actualization and the higher level needs, but your partner is barely even giving you the lower level needs right now. So I want you to imagine again, your partner falls short. They cannot even give you the lower level needs and you realize too that you're only gonna live once and you have to spend the rest of your life with this person. And you're not allowed to choose another person. You're not allowed to doubt the relationship. You're not allowed to second guess the relationship. You have just one life and you've got one life to make it count. And you realize that this relationship will never really give you that, right? Because not only does it fall short in terms of giving you the values that you need, but whenever you express your level of unhappiness, you express that you're not getting the higher level needs. Your partner is not willing to talk about it. They get defensive about it. 
they start blaming you. Basically the three misconceptions that we talked about in the past, what would you do? How would you feel at this point? So now if you're your partner, then you're left with three equally bad choices. Number one is that you could try to talk to your partner about this, about how unhappy you feel, about how you're not getting the higher level needs, etc. But choice number one is that if you try to talk to, about this with your partner, you will end up feeling a bit more belittled, a bit more hopeless, and you might feel a lot less safe as well. So obviously choice number one is not really a choice. Now let's look at choice number two. Choice number two is that you can abandon all the fantasies that you had, all the dreams that you had, all the expectations that you had, because you realize that this relationship can never really give you what you want. So you lower those standards and you take your one and only life you have and you lower those standards. And you realize that in this one life, I will never get what I wanted. I'll always fall short of it, which is also not a good choice if you think about it. The third choice is you say, okay, I don't want choice number one or two. So I want number three, which is that I want to leave. I want to consider another relationship. I want space. But if you choose the third option where you want space, you're again going to be painted the villain. You might be making your partner feel very hopeless and dejected and just all pouty and sad. Or you might get your partner to totally misunderstand the situation again and not understand the true root reasons of why you are unhappy and why you want space. And guys, one thing to understand too is that nobody really wants space unless they're really unhappy about something in the relationship and they feel this catch-22. So I want you to imagine just how much of a catch-22 you would feel if you were only presented with these three options of these three equally bad options. So your partner only wants space, guys, when she feels this intense catch-22, where everywhere she steps, she feels like she's stepping in the wrong direction. She cannot win anywhere she goes. So a lot of guys, when they get their partner to tell them, I want space, for example, they often think that they're the victim and they got all sad because of it, they tried to blame their partner, etc. But if you do this thought experiment with me and really truly take the time to really feel what a catch-22 your partner is in right now, I want you to reconsider the question, who's really the victim here? You or also equally, also your partner as well. And the second thought experiment I want you to do with me is I want you to think for a moment just how big of an ask it is to have your partner spend her one and only life with you and not even be able to express how unhappy she feels, not be able to express just if she wants space from the relationship and she wants to consider being single or even another relationship. Think about how big of an ask that is. You're basically asking her to give her one and only life for you. Now, if you want to ask something that big, then you also have to ask the counter question, which is, have I been delivering big to deserve a good answer to that ask? And usually when you truly try to answer that question for yourself, you will realize and you will understand why your partner wants space a lot more. If you're still thinking that there's really not a good reason why my partner wants space, or she doesn't really feel this cash 22, et cetera. I want you to think carefully about what you're insinuating about your partner here. You are saying to your partner here, and you're saying to the world and to yourself that your partner is so messed up that even if you actually gave the high level values, that even though you delivered on what you need to do to deserve the answer yes to the big ask of having her spend her one and only life with you. She's so messed up that she can't even look at that, appreciate that and decide for herself that I want that. If you think so lowly of your partner like this, the ironic part is that if you're in denial of how maybe not as high a value you are, it should be no mystery why your partner wants space in the first place. I want you to think about this very deeply guys. So just to recap here, why your partner wants space is not because of all the problems you think it is. It's not that she's non-committed. It's not that she has having a midlife crisis and depression and anxiety issues, etc. But it's really that your relationship right now lacks even a shred of safety. And it lacks safety so much that she feels herself being in this catch-22 like we talked about. Where option one, where she talks, is not an option. Where she lowers the standards, it's also not a good option. Where she leaves, it's also not a good option. Anywhere she steps, it's not a good option. But if you create safety, what you're doing is you're looking at the three choices and you're saying, choice number one now has become available, which is that you can talk about your problems, your unhappiness with me, and we can resolve it, we can understand it, and we can do something about it. Once you create safety, you get your partner out of this catch-22. So the only reason, again, why your partner wants space is that none of these choices are available. She's in a very difficult catch-22. So now that we understand that, let's revisit the three misconceptions we talked about earlier. And let's talk about the three key mistakes that a lot of men make. Number one is they take their partner wanting space and they start to get all demotivated and they start to give up on the relationship themselves. And to do this, I want you to do another thought experiment, another imagination exercise with me. Imagine you're working for a leader. And at this point, you are very unhappy in this relationship with this leader because this leader has this pattern that whenever 
you talk about him with about problems. Whenever the company goes through some rough periods, some challenges, he takes those challenges and those difficulties and he kind of feels demotivated. He gives up a bit. He gets all dejected. He gets all sad. And in fact, the more difficult of the problems you express, for example, you tell him, hey, I feel a bit hopeless right now about this problem. And he takes you feeling hopeless and says, okay, I feel hopeless too then. Can you feel safe? Do you want to actually express the problems to him? If you can't even express, then how can you even resolve the problems? Of course, the answer to these questions are gonna be very obvious. You're not gonna feel safe. You are gonna feel like this is going nowhere. This relationship is going nowhere. I can't talk about anything with this guy. So in other words, you would feel the same question you too as well. Now imagine that you finally had the last straw and you're saying to your leader basically, hey, I think I'm out. I feel really hopeless. I feel this question you too, no matter where I step is wrong. And I feel like there's no, this can't go anywhere anymore. This relationship cannot go anywhere anymore. And he takes you saying that and he gets even more hopeless. So he shows the exact sign that makes you feel hopeless in the first place. What would you feel at that point? If I was me, I would think, hmm, the fact that it's reacting this way right now, the fact that it's giving up right now, confirms to me that yes, leaving is the right choice here because this guy cannot take any tough news, any difficult news. And this guy is not a leader to fix problems with. So this is exactly what's happening when you take your partner feeling hopeless because she's in the catch 22 where she says she wants space and you think, oh, that's hopeless and you give up and get all sad and dejected as well. This is the message you're sending. But imagine if again, you go back to the example of the leader and this time you express to him how you feel this catch 22 how you hopeless you feel, but then he reacts in a very different way. He reacts in a very positive way. He reacts in a very inspired way where he says, okay, thanks for telling me this. Let's work through it together. I'm gonna work on myself. I'm gonna work on changing the culture and changing the perception of me. Let's do it. What would you think there? Would you question your decision to leave now? Would you think to yourself, hmm, that's odd. Maybe this is different. Of course you would. And so when you do not get all hopeless and dejected whenever your partner feels hopeless, this is also the message you're sending, the more positive message you're sending. Now mistake number two here is again, you start to blame this on your partner. So again, I want you to think about this example with the boss again, with the leader again. And this leader has just a pattern of shifting blame. So whenever you talk about the problems, whenever you talk about issues about the company and how maybe hopeless you feel, maybe how exhausted you feel, etc., he comes around and says, well, this is a problem with you. Uh, you are ungrateful. I've given you everything in this company. You're getting paid so much you have no reason to complain right now. I want you to think about how much of a question to you feel. Because again, option number one of talking about the problems with your boss or your leader is not an option. So you're left with choice number two now, which is you lower your standards or you leave. So let's say that you tried option number one and two for a long time and you decide, this is kind of the last straw for me. I don't wanna work on this for this boss, this leader, this company anymore. And you say, you know what? Let me present to you another problem, which is now that I feel hopeless. I feel dejected. I feel exhausted. I don't want to work for this anymore. And he once again responds to that by shifting blame and blaming you for being ungrateful. What would you feel at that point? You would think to yourself, hmm, I think this is the right decision to leave because his actions shows a lot about why I need to leave. And so if you have your partner saying she wants space and you say to her, this is your fault, you shift blame and you start getting angry at her, this is the exact message you're sending as well. But if you were to take the other approach of let's say, hmm, let me look within to see if this is really a flaw within me. Let me not shift blame. Let me see my contribution to the problem. If your boss can do that, if your leader can do that, you would have some doubts about leaving again. And same thing here. If you can react in a positive way, that's how you slowly put the seed of doubt in your partner's mind about leaving, about her wanting space. And mistake number three, and this is really the worst mistake, is the mistake of misdiagnosing the true reasons why she wants space or the true reasons why she wants to leave at the moment. Because this problem again can be disguised in the disguise of trying to help. So this is when men, for example, uh, have a conversation with their partner about them wanting space and they ask why and their partner just says, oh, it's because I'm having, I'm going through a lot right now. I'm going through some midlife crisis. And these men think, oh, because she's telling me it's a midlife crisis. So it must be a midlife crisis. Now these guys, they're trying to help, but they may not be helping in the correct way. And the best example I can give to this is, you know, when I was younger, I used to play golf. And my mom used to love to try to send me to the golf tournament, drive me there. But I always wanted to take the bus because I knew that my mom was always late. So there's one tournament where I was leading the tournament. I was doing very well. And uh, my mom said, hey, uh, let me drive you to your tournament. 
And I said, no, I want to take the bus. But she insisted. I want to drive you to the tournament. But she was late. And because she was late, I was disqualified. And I lost a great opportunity to actually win the tournament. Now, at that point in time, I couldn't really express my anger and my frustration to my mom because she was trying to help. And my mom was also in denial of the fact that her trying to help actually did not help. And it's kind of the same thing here where a lot of these men, they think they're helping by trying to look at her midlife crisis, look at the depression, the anxiety issues. But sometimes the way they help may not be the right way to help. So what you need to understand guys when your partner wants space is that your partner wants space because she lacks safety. And when your partner lacks safety, she can never really one, tell you what she's truly feeling because it's a lack of safety to actually tell you what she's feeling, why she actually wants space. And when you lack safety too, you're also creating this environment in the relationship where your partner may find it difficult to actually go deep within her psyche, to actually investigate herself on why she actually wants space. Usually when you lack safety, your partner is not gonna understand why she wants space. She just knows she feels bad, but she can't really articulate why she feels bad. So when your partner tells you, hey, I'm having anxiety issues, I'm having depression issues, and that's why I want to leave, and so I want space, that may not be the root of why she wants space. Again, the root you have to understand is that there's a lack of safety to even talk about it. Because again, when you have safety, sure, your partner may still have midlife crises, anxiety issues, depression issues, but at least with safety and with admiration with the five pillars, she will at least wanna go through it with you. When she wants space, she's basically saying, I have all these things, but I don't want to go through it with you. So the root again, guys, is always the safety issues. So don't get caught by what she tells you about what the real root reasons of why she wants space. The real reason again is that there's a massive lack of safety here. So I want you to see for all these um, three mistakes that you can make, there's a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy here where your partner feeling hopeless makes you feel hopeless, for example, and you feeling hopeless makes your partner feel even more hopeless. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where if you're not careful, you actually make what you want to believe actually happen. So let's talk about the solutions then on, okay, if your partner wants space, what can you do to reattract her at the moment? And if you watch a lot of videos on this topic, they'll always tell you things like, oh, you need to better yourself. Now, their definition of what it means to better yourself is usually what I call the necessary but not sufficient. So they will tell you, for example, oh, you need to work on maybe getting more money, maybe going to the gym and losing more weight and dressing better. All these things that are what I call necessary. Yes, it's necessary for you to look better, to lose weight maybe, to get fit again, to remove some bad habits here and there, but they're not sufficient in itself. Because at the end of the day, again, you need to understand how to create the safety. You need to understand how to create the five pillars because that's the one thing that will get her out of the catch-22. And this starts with, Number one, you need to get rid of the internal denial first. And when I enroll new clients, guys, this is actually the biggest step that I have to get them to accept is to recognize the denial about, let's say, their own contribution to the problem that they actually made to the relationship, the level of catch-22 that they have created for their partner. Before anything can happen, before they can grow and learn, they need to accept a lot of these things about themselves, about the relationship, etc. Like if you go to this 12-step program, for example, the first step is what? is admitting that you're an alcoholic, essentially. And without that first step, nothing else can happen. Same thing here, without accepting the fact that, yes, there was a lot of things you could done that contributed to the problem of her wanting space. If you can accept that, nothing else can happen. So for example, it's really easy to tell yourself that it's over, that you've done everything you could and there's nothing else you can do about it. Because when you tell yourself this, when you tell yourself it's over and there's nothing else you can do, it absolves you of any more work. It absolves you of having to discover and learn things that you may not know right now. And it's easy to see yourself as a victim here and start to blame your partner, for example, but you have to understand the fact that your partner at one point did choose you. Your partner probably took a lot of months and years to try to save this relationship, to try to make the relationship work. So you have to question just how high value you actually are at this point. And if you still think you're actually really high value, then you need to rethink that. You need to really rethink that because would your partner really leave someone or want space from someone who's truly 10X anybody else, even the prospect of being single in creating safety, creating admiration, alignment, sexual passion, etc. I don't think so. Because again, if you just were able to create a shared of safety, take a look at the three choices again, you would make the first choice available. You would get your partner out of this catch 22 completely. And at that point, if you just have safety, if you have a shred of safety, you might find that your partner does not really want space anymore. And the fact that your partner wants space means that none of these options are available because you lack so much safety. And if you lack so much safety, how high value can you be? 
And it's easy guys, to sit on your high horse, for example, and listen to your partner by saying, hey, uh, yeah, she's not leaving because I'm not able to create safety. She's leaving because she's having some midlife crisis, some anxiety issues, some unresolved childhood traumas, etc. But again, we need to accept the fact that if your partner really had safety, if you were able to create safety for your partner, that she might still have these problems, but she will at least go through it with you. The very fact that she has these problems and does not want to go through it with you means that you have not created safety for your partner. And once you accept that, then we can really get somewhere because once you accept your own flaws, we can start working on those flaws. And the second thing we can do is that we need to stop worsening the hemorrhage accidentally. So there was a story where I had a client coming in and he was telling me the story of how his partner was mad at him about some part of what he did. And he started to just coach her and tell her his perspective. Hey, you got it wrong. Uh, here's what I was actually trying to do. Here's what I was trying to say to you. You totally misunderstood me, etc. And he thought at this point he was doing the correct thing. But what he didn't realize was that at that point in time by saying, hey, whatever you feel is wrong, you have misunderstood me. Let me tell you what I think. Let me tell you my perspective. He was actually invalidating her feelings and destroying safety at that very moment. That's what we call the paradox of logic. So here, he thought he was doing something right, something good that actually created safety. But actually he was destroying safety in a very covert subconscious way. And if, if all my clients look back at their relationship, they'll see a lot of very covert and subconscious ways that they're destroying safety. They're worsening the hemorrhage of their relationship. And what you need to understand when your partner wants space is that your relationship has been hemorrhaging for a very long time. And so the first thing you need to do is to stop that hemorrhage. So there are three things we do in the program that really gets people to stop the hemorrhage. Number one is we remind people that you cannot use the same knowledge that created the problems in the first place to try to solve your problem with those same knowledge. If you want to solve your problems, you need to solve them using very different paradigms, very different approaches than what you're used to. So right now, the first thing you need to do is to question what you think is right to do in a relationship. And number two is to stop manufacturing contact. Uh, we always say in the program, the biggest shame is not having no contact. The biggest shame is manufacturing contact and having nothing to show in terms of changes, improvements, etc. Because when you manufacture contact and you cannot show any changes, you're basically taking an opportunity, the very limited opportunities you have to actually show your changes. And you're basically saying, you know what? Let me just throw that in the bin, the opportunity in the bin. And you may not get unlimited opportunities at this point. So again, the biggest shame is not having no contact, but the biggest shame is manufacturing contact and having nothing to show in terms of changes. And number three is, we also teach people what we call the TTH, treating the hemorrhage script, which is a script that we teach people very early on in the program on how to conduct short-term conversations, to try to delay the conversation, but delay in a way where you're very clear about what your intentions for delaying are, and to plant seeds in a way of that, the fact that you are trying to change, you admit your flaws, you understand your flaws, you understand the problem here, and that you're trying to work on it. And that's why you're delaying the interactions in the conversation. While you are kind of stopping the hemorrhage and you're delaying conversations, you're delaying interactions, deep interactions, you're also working on your internal shifts here. And this includes, for example, getting rid of the victim mindset, getting rid of what we call the disguises of desires, the thoughts, the paradigms that are keeping you very tethered to your relationship, very tethered to your partner, and if you're tethered again, you cannot really become a leader to inspire other people, but you're always gonna be tethered to the outcome, the circumstance, and you are a follower, you're not a leader. You cannot save your relationship if you're tethered. And we also address kind of the other layers of the bulletproof vest where we talk about the fundamental attribution error, talk about antithetic thinking, etc. as well. And that's a reason if you watch any of my interviews with my clients, you'll always hear them prioritize the internal shifts first because this is the only way where you can do the right things and do it not in a forced way, but do it in a much more genuine way. Basically starting with the internal shifts is the only way that the external stuff, whatever you say and do, can come from a more proper and effective place, but also from a more genuine place where it's more believable to your partner. So if you're having your partner struggle to believe you, to trust your changes right now. What you lack is often the internal shifts. That you may be doing the right things, but you're doing the right things with the wrong micro expressions, with the wrong micro tones, with the wrong intention. And that will smell very fishy to your partner and that will make your changes very hard to believe. And only once you master the internal shifts do you actually master the external stuff. So in our program, we call this the frameworks. And in our program, we have seven frameworks that you can use to basically use as tools that you can guide every conversation with. And with the seven tools, you can really find yourself dancing through every conversation, every resistance, 
to not only make your partner feel understood, to create that level of safety, but also to plant seeds of your changes, to plant seeds that you are changing, that you are admitting your flaws and that you are a very different person at this moment. And the thing about mastering these frameworks, guys, is that once you master these frameworks, you will find very creative ways to actually start campaigns, start conversations, even when you find yourself in a no contact situation. And a lot of people who partner one space are finding themselves in this position, or even when you find yourself blocked on social media or through, through text messages, you will always find a way to start a conversation in a very surgical way, in a very artful way that seems very natural, that actually allows you to plant the seeds of your changes, allows you to further the conversation even more. And if you want to see a sneak preview of how this is done, you can watch the interview I have with guys like Michael, for example, or Eve, where they talk about them being in a no contact situation. And in some cases here, their partner was actually in another country completely, but they were still able to manufacture contact in the correct way, in a very artful way, in a way that actually nurtures safety, admiration, alignment, etc. And so if you want to explore a program that teaches you these internal shifts, but also the external shifts to be able to build the five pillars here, then I want you to join me in my masterclass on the five proven steps to rebuilding your relationship from the ground up. In that masterclass, I'll show you the exact steps that took clients like Michael or Eve, for example, that I mentioned earlier, from a very dire state where their partner wants space or even something even worse than space to a thriving state in the relationship. So if you want to join me in that masterclass, you can click the link above my head also down below this video. For now, guys, I'll see you in the next one.